You know how many times I've heard this joke since this great Michael Crichton read-along began is The Terminal Man. Is that the movie where Tom Hanks is standing in an airport? No, not quite. Hey, what's up, bookworms and Michael Crichton maniacs? Mike back again today to talk a little Michael Crichton with his 1972 story, The Terminal Man. I am reading out of this collection of the first three books he released under his own name because, well, damn it, those hardcovers are very, very pricey. So this is what uh, what I settled for. But this is the second novel released under his own name as we continue the great Michael Crichton read-along here. This is the second book in that offering. I read this for the first time when I was 15, and I remember enjoying it, And uh, but this time I felt like it was kind of the same. Uh, it's not one of my favorite stories of his, but again, I feel like the worst Michael Crichton sometimes, and I'm not saying that's what this is, I'm just saying uh, a not-so-great Michael Crichton is probably better than a lot of other novelists' best stuff, so let's talk about this one. I think after an Andromeda strain kind of made Crichton a, a household name at this point. Uh, for me, I felt like even before I had read Michael Crichton, I had heard of Andromeda Strain. And that's when I was, you know, a preteen because I read that way earlier than I read this one in the uh, the summer. I guess the, the fall of 1993 was that first time that I read this. When Michael Crichton first became endeared to me uh, during that uh, freshman year, new city, didn't know anybody, no friends, huge library. And I was introduced to the world of Crichton and King and Anne Rice. And that's kind of what began this whole bookworm thing. But guys, let's go ahead and talk about The Terminal Man by getting into what is it about now? Harry Benson suffers from violent seizures, so violent that he often has rage blackouts when they take hold. Now, shortly after severely beating two men during an episode, the police escort Benson to a Los Angeles hospital for treatment. There, Dr. Roger McPherson, head of the prestigious Neuropsychiatric Research Unit, is convinced he can cure Benson with an experimental procedure that would place electrodes deep in his brain's pleasure centers, effectively short-circuiting hairy seizures with pulses of bliss. Now, the surgery, known as Stage 3, has never been successfully administered, but McPherson thinks it's worth the risk despite what could be the possible fallout. And spoiler, guys, don't think that that's actually true. Now, with this, when you talk about what makes it good or bad, first of all, the good with all Michael Crichton is going to be the science and how forward-thinking that he was. Because the idea of neural implants for brain conditions in 1972 was still like a super cyberpunky kind of imagining. I think going through people's imagination, it was nothing really that we were thinking, okay, yeah, yeah, that's going to be happening by the 2000s. You know, it's not going to say it's something that's like prevalent now, but you know, we can do stuff like this now. Now it's more, a, now it's more of a, a conversation about ethics. Should we do this or not? You know, or what, what, what point are we becoming less, you know, just subhuman at this point? So, I can see the, the the differences reading it now between you know in the 70s and reading it now is you can be like ah eh, that's not that that unbelievable but it's one of those things again with all his books I think you're gonna hear me say in this in this in this uh, whole retrospective of Michael Crichton is how ahead of the curve he was and all these things because like always you can fact check the science in this books and you can be like yeah he did his homework and a lot of the things that it seemed like he was kind of uh, using a hypothesis for have very much become true. So uh, again, like I said, I don't feel like, you know, where people are walking around, oh, I don't have seizures anymore because I get these blips in my brain for these neural implants. You know, we have messed with electrodes in the brain and things like that. But again, I'll leave that up for you to research like I did. But this examines the idea of adding machine parts, making us less human, like I said, more subhuman. And this is something I feel like it's just, it's like an inevitability at this point. Um, you know, it isn't just a, a super uh, cyberpunk sci-fi kind of story element anymore. It really is something that it feels like it's inevitable. I mean, we are at the point where we use so many different like data assistants during the day. At what point are we just going to be like, shoot that shit into my veins, right? And you know, you're going to see people with a um, 
contact lenses that can read their email and things like that. I really believe this. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of how far are we going to take it. You know, I don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime, but you know, you're a younger viewer. Maybe you'll see it, you know, in yours. So uh, it, it's something that really will get the uh, the brain working in more ways than one. This story. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think that the idea that the fear of machines because of our dependency upon them is a real, real thing in this. You know, the, the main character here is actually scared of machines because he feels like it's a point where the machines are going to take us over. You know, you start thinking about Battlestar Galactica or something like that. Oh, shoot, the Cylons are coming, right? Uh, I love that idea. I love that idea that even this is in a pre-Terminator world, we're thinking of the machines taking over, the, you know, Cyberdyne. It, it's, it's really, really a, a fun thing that's been done for, you know, even well before Crichton did it in science fiction. But it's always something, I think, kind of fun to play with. And I, I like the idea that this messes with the idea of the victim in something like this or the protagonist or whatever you want to call Harry in this. The idea of the person that has this thing happen to them is already super intelligent. So what is going to be the fallout, uh, you know, with someone that's super intelligent when this happens? So it's, I think it's kind of a, a nice little twist because usually it's either it's just an everyman or it's someone who was a dummy, you know, or something like that. Uh, it never really has ever been like someone who, I mean, this guy's a computer engineer. He's really, really super sharp. And then this happens and uh, things really, really go haywire, pun intended. Much like I said earlier, I think it is very much questioning the ethics of things like this. How far is too far? Are we messing with things that we should not be messing with? Are we playing God? You know, it's kind of like what we look at. I think of in this 1972, the way that this was looked at, is kind of like how we look at cloning today. Could it be done? Maybe. Should we do it? Probably not. You know, it's, 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 it's a point where... Like I said, uh, at what point are we no longer human? You know, you think about, you clone something, is it really gonna be the same? Is it gonna be a copy of a copy of a copy kind of thing? Uh, so uh, again, finding the different themes in science and, and looking forward to uh, science fiction possibilities, you know, in the 70s, obviously it's gonna be very, very different. But uh, that's kind of the way that I looked at it. It's kind of like, the, just it's a question of ethics, you know, should this be done, even if we can do it? Now, I think the best thing about this book, really guys, is it's a quick read, just like a lot of Crichton stuff. It's like 250 pages, I blew through it in about a day and a half. Uh, even with all the science and medical info, again, this is what Crichton does the best, is he puts the science into layman's terms, where you can understand everything that is going on. You know, they talk about this, uh, this, this brain surgery operation at length, and you, again, you never feel bored. Just like I said with, uh, with Andromeda Strain, they're talking a lot of science mumbo jumbo. Not quite as much. There's not quite as much about enzymes and amino acids and things like that. But there are different parts of it. And you can see that Mr. Crichton obviously paid attention when he was in medical school. Because uh, uh, if you had told me he was actually a practicing doctor, I probably would have believed you. And I love it in the back of this book. There's actually like diagrams and things of like how the surgery, how these wires were going to be implanted in the brain and the thing that goes in the shoulder and all that. And it looks real. It looks like, wow, is this actually, this actually looks like full on x-rays and stuff of this procedure. So. That's a nice little add-on that uh, I wasn't in the version of the book that I read when I read it at 15. So that was a nice uh, new little twist there. And again, that's this uh, this this collection that has all three of them. It has that that in it. I think this one's probably a little more action-packed than Drama Strain. At least the back half is. I felt like in Drama Strain was really really slow until like the last. 30 pages. It really, it really was. I loved it. Don't get me wrong, but I'm saying it wasn't really an action book. I think this one, the whole second half of the book is pretty much nonstop adrenaline ride. It's what Crichton would eventually become, you know, the techno thriller guy. You can kind of see that here. Very back heavy, but very, very good and very, very satisfying. Mostly. So that makes me to the bad. Now, I think that something that Crichton gets nailed for routinely throughout his career is his poor characterization skills. He doesn't. He spends so much time on the science and describing the situation to you. He doesn't spend a lot of time developing his characters. Now, I felt like that was always kind of overblown. It's kind of like Stephen King can't write an ending. I, I think some books like this with Crichton, uh, yes, very much the case. Just like with King, yeah, there's some that endings are just like, really, that's all you got? And I think that you kind of develop that reputation of that's your downfall because people just want to talk about that one bad thing that you can't do. Uh, but um, I think with this one, it's very true because he probably could have used about another 100 pages to flesh out the characters. I feel Dr. Ross was the only one who really had any bit of differ differentiating them because you got to see her, her view of this basically. You think about this again. 
this is hospital in the 70s here it's very much a boys club and she's basically looked down on because she's just a psychiatrist and things like that but uh yeah it's very very much uh from her view you kind of see how she's treated differently uh just because you know she is a female in this situation and stuff and i really feel like she was the only one that you can really get anything of knowing anything about her besides harry you know i i don't feel like you know anything i don't think you can really differentiate any of the doctors in this they're all just like doctors it's something that he got better at as it went along but like, again 250 pages he really didn't take the time he needed to develop these characters not even as well as he did with the four uh the four in the group on in, uh, in andromeda strain so uh step backwards in that regard a step forwards i think with the uh with the, the whole techno thriller kind of ideas and things like that another problem huge climax huge build up poof it's over i heard a lot of people say that kind of about andromeda strain now look with Crichton is he is show don't tell he's going to give you the ending that's it i've wrapped up the story i don't need to tell you the aftermath that's something very, very normal. With this, it literally is like, wow, I mean, it, it, am I missing the last chapter? It really, really is sudden. It really is. But uh, again, I don't think that really either of those things really take away from this book. It's a fun little read. It's nothing you're going to be, you know, making like a top 10 Michael Crichton characters list. No one from this book is going to make it probably. Uh, but uh, but again, the science is great. The action is really, really good. The suspense is phenomenal. And uh, again, I think you'll just flip through the pages like really, really quick, especially this back half. Let's talk about why you should read it. Uh, as with all things Crichton, like I said, I love that he is able to put the science in a language that everyone can understand. It doesn't matter how much. I mean, like, guys, I struggled in biology. I struggled in physical science, chemical science, things like that when I was back in school. Uh, I, I, took a, I took two years of astrophysics in college. That was easier than some other stuff. But anyhow, this, yeah, it, it, the way that he writes, guys, it just it makes it so easy for you to understand. It's like that kind of thing. It's like, I wish that my actual doctor would talk to me like this because I'll tell you what's wrong with you. You'd be like, can you put that in English for me, doc? And that's what Crichton does. He puts it in English for you. Another thing is if you are a fan of Black Mirror on Netflix, I can think of about five or six episodes that take ideas from this book. And now it might not be exactly from this, but you're going to be like, oh yeah, this sounds like an episode of Black Mirror. So uh, I'm not blaming them, saying, accusing them of like copyright infringement or anything like that. I'm just saying that you will read this and thank Black Mirror the whole time. Or if you read this first and then you watch Black Mirror, you'll be thanking Terminal Man for sure. Uh, because uh, they love to mess with the brain on Black Mirror and, and things that we should not be doing with our brains probably. Uh, but I definitely feel like they borrow heavily from this, whether that is the case or not. It's a terrific palate cleanser, guys. Look, I was broken after I finished uh, book two of the Malice and Book of the Fallen. And I was like, I cannot read another fantasy book right now. So I picked this up. It felt great to read this, you know, real quick, a day and a half after I finished that Malazan book and it really kind of got me over that little slump I was in there. So uh, again, if you're looking for a palate cleanser, man, Michael Crichton is one of the best to do that. If you're, especially these early ones, if you're not looking for a book as thick as like a, a Stephen King or something like that. 250 pages, man, it's in and out before you know it. Quick two day read and it'll stay in your head for a couple of days and just make sure those wires aren't connected, right? So if I have any final thoughts, guys, look, it's not any, it's not a bad book by any stretch. I mean, this is Crichton after all. He didn't do that. He didn't write bad books ever. But I, I would say it is kind of a sophomore slump because when you can look at it historically, it is sandwiched between two great books. Now, in my memory, The Great Train Robbery, which is the book that we'll be doing next month for April, uh, The Great Train Robbery is really, really fun. And I love Andromeda Strain. So in my memory, this sandwich between those two is kind of like, eh, kind of like the uh, the... the less attractive stepbrother but you know you, you wouldn't kick him out of bed that kind of thing it's a fun story that i think that you will enjoy but just like when i made my top 10 list recently for Crichton, i don't think this will crack into your top 10 Crichton stories it's just again it, it's so short and it, it lacks a lot of character depth i think but again if you're looking for something just to be not a heavy commitment or anything like that you got some time you got a couple of days before you want to read something else i definitely think this will fill in the blanks for you he was still kind of 
you know, finding his feet as an author, I think, and his character work still had a long way to go. And if I recall correctly, I think Eaters of the Dead was the first one where I really started to think, okay, his characters are getting much, much better. Even though I like the uh, the pair in The Great Train Robbery, and we'll talk about that one next month. So well, I'm going to end these like I do with it. When I do a Stephen King, I talk about multiverse connections. Uh, since Crichton doesn't have a multiverse, his books are fully standalone. What I'm going to do is look at his adaptations because I feel like uh, no author has been adapted as much as Michael Crichton, except maybe Stephen King. It feels like he is the only other one who everything he ever wrote, like seriously, as soon as it hit the stands, the rights were snatched up by a movie studio somewhere. So with this one, 1974 is The Terminal Man, directed by Mike Hodges. And the funny thing about this is I did a little research about it. Apparently, Michael Crichton was picked by the studio to write and direct this. Now, here's the thing. You might be like, wow, really? Michael Crichton was actually already working with Hollywood at this point. He was a couple years still away from making uh, Westworld, I believe, if I have the years right here. So uh, Westworld, you know that show you guys like on HBO? Yeah, that stemmed off of his idea in the movie that he directed in the 70s with uh, with Yul Brynner. Really good, by the way. Uh, but uh, he actually turned in his screenplay, and apparently the studio didn't like it. And he's like, so it's like the book? or he, I mean, to, to the day, I mean, the latest, latest comments he had before he passed away, I don't want to say to the day, obviously, uh, he was still saying that he didn't feel like the studio gave it a chance. And then I looked at the studio. Of course it's Warner Brothers. They've always been like this, right? So they didn't like his script. Uh, the problem with this movie for me is it feels like two different directors. The first half of the movie feels very faithful to the book. It really feels like a medical drama. Once you get to the part where you get to the techno thriller, movie completely changes it seems like it starts just going for a complete art artsy i don't know art film it's really what it feels like it's really just like depending on these white colors on red backgrounds and things like that it, the cinematography completely changes it really just feels like they tried to make it something that it wasn't and you'll see guys this is what starts to happen to michael crichton adaptations andromeda strain super faithful Every other Michael Crichton adaptation, not. And it seems like it started as early as this one. This is my first one, uh, my first time watching this one. But um, yeah, it feels like they they read the first third of the book and they said, let's start filming, you know, before they knew what was going on. So uh, look, the second half of that movie is not faithful to this book in the least. And in my opinion, it's kind of dog shit. Yeah, I mean, my wife hasn't read the book. She watched the movie with me and she was like, I don't even know what's going on half the time and the other half, I just don't care. So uh, it, it would be a big fat do not recommend uh, for me. Yes, definitely read the book. Uh, if you're like me and you want to just watch all the adaptations afterwards, sure, watch it, but you're not going to be satisfied. I think like you were quite with Andromeda Strain, which was like to the point where it was like reciting lines of dialogue straight from that book. This one, no, after about the 45 minute mark, it does like its own thing. And it is not what I read, like, at all. And the ending is just like, what in the world is this crap? So, again, you'll hear me say that a lot with these Michael Crichton adaptations going forward. I hope you guys will join us next month for The Great Train Robbery. I think it's just as short of a read as this and probably even quicker. In my memory, this is very Butch and Sundance, just real, real page turner. You're going to have a blast with it. This is when I think he first kind of veered, maybe not so much away from the medical and the science and really just got into the adventure and it's really, really fun in my memory. And I can't wait to see if it is the same way. So guys, if you read The Terminal Man, what did you think? Drop in the comments and let me know and I hope to talk to you next month for The Great Train Robbery. I'll talk to you there.